Our study today begins in verse 19 of chapter 26 through the end of the chapter, verse 32. Father, as we open our Bibles, we ask you to open our hearts by the power of your Spirit, Lord. May we be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and the only place that we can be made new in our mind is in your word by acquiescing to whatever it is that you say. Inspire us today, Lord. Challenge us. I do pray, Father, if there's anybody in this service or in the two services that follow, if they're not yet born again, that this would be the day that he or she or they would surrender their hearts to you. Maybe today, Lord, with the help of your Spirit, we can almost persuade us people to be a Christian. We love you, God, and we're grateful for all that you've done. We pray these things by faith in the wonderful and beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, Texas has it right. Now, coming from California, we never had turnarounds. I had no idea what a turnaround was. Somebody explained to me, well, you know, if you're really, really lost, then you just turn around and you can be found. And I thought, well, that's the gospel. That really is. Now, the reality, however, is that the single most hated word in the Christian vocabulary is the word repent. Let me prove it to you. When you leave here today, if there is somebody, even a Christian, maybe especially a Christian, and they're doing things that you know and they know they ought not to do, and you call them on it and you say, brother, sister, you really need to repent. We all know what response we're going to get. You're judging me. By the way, sometimes it's a good time to be judged. Better that we do it then God does it. But repent is the single most hated word in the Christian vocabulary, tragically even among Christians. It is also, according to our Bibles, according to John the Baptist, according to Jesus, according to the Apostle Paul and all of the other writers of our Bible, Repent is also the very first word of the gospel. And that's where Paul begins as he stands before King Agrippa, <clears throat> Bernice by his side, as we begin this morning. Verse 19 says, So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Now, obviously, the vision from heaven was Paul's Damascus Road experience. It was one of those moments that changed the history of the world. Jesus had said, I've appointed you as a servant, as, as a witness. And that meant that Paul, Saul of Tarsus at that point, had no choice but to get busy and obey. And Paul did so immediately. No delaying. I think sometimes we know what God wants us to do and we find a reason to sort of procrastinate. We find a reason to put it off for a better time, a more convenient time. The only time to obey God is right now, today, immediately. Here's how we obeyed. In verse 20, it says, first to those in Damascus. I want to stop there because that's one of these little nuggets in scripture that I think we just read right over. We know that in Damascus, that's where Paul was found by the Lord. And he was told to go into Damascus, a house on Straight Street. There you will be told what you must do. And as soon as he was told what he must do, he began right there where he was. He didn't wait to be mature in the Lord. He didn't wait to, to get directions. He didn't wait for answers to the, the myriad of questions that he must have had. He started right there. There Now, we can only imagine what it was like to see this terrorist, and I described him as that in our study last week, to see this terrorist all of a sudden out in the streets instead of persecuting Christians, now he's telling people about the risen Christ. 
And he would be able to say from a position of authority, I saw him, I know he's alive. And everybody would be confused. We know that later when Paul went into Jerusalem, the people there couldn't believe what they were hearing and they were wary of that. They, they kind of kept their distance, afraid that it was some evil trick. But he started right there. I remember I was running a Cadillac Mitsubishi GMC truck and Range Rover store when I got saved. And I didn't know what else to do, so I got saved. Obviously, everything in my life had changed. And right there in that car dealership is when I began telling people about Jesus. And they would look at me like, well, wait a minute, I just knew you a week ago and you were this jerk. Well, of course I was. But I'm not that person anymore. And the reason is because you always start where you are. We start in our homes. We start in our places of work. We start in our neighborhoods. We start with our own family members. And we don't have to have great theological insight. All we need to do, as we've been saying week after week after week, is tell people what God has done for you. But don't wait until it's comfortable. Don't wait until you know more. Don't wait until Jesus appears to you and gives you marching orders. Start where you are. It is the most effective place to begin. And if you are anything like my experience, people will look at you like, yeah, don't preach to me. I know who you are. But then they can be on guard and they can begin watching you change before their very eyes. Paul began in Damascus. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also I preach that they should repent and turn to God, and highlight this word, prove their repentance by their deeds. Now the Living Bible says this very clearly. The translation says that they prove their repentance by doing good deeds. In other words, we change the things that we didn't care about before we now care about. We, we want to do good works. We want to be kind to people. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. All of those things, that needs to be who we are. That's our new character. Now, some people say, well, you can't change that quickly. Well, the power that raised Christ and the dead comes to live in you. You can change instantly, but you've got to partner with God and begin the process. I shared with you in a study a couple of weeks ago that I used to swear all the time at the foulest mouth ever, but I knew it was wrong. And so I couldn't just excuse the habit that I'd fallen into. I, I couldn't go home and be unkind to Paula the way I'd been unkind to her. I knew that had to change. Now, I didn't have all of the answers, and certainly I didn't do it perfectly. But I knew that I had to change. And that's the one thing, because I shared with you that I was too proud to tell Paula she was right. But she could see that there was a change. Now, what Paul is giving here before Agrippa and Bernice is no, no seeker-sensitive message. Repent means a U-turn in life. You were going one way, running away from God. You met Jesus, you turned around, and you began running after the Lord himself. To repent means to agree with and turn to God. One of my favorite examples in all of the New Testament of what genuine repentance actually looks like is a story of, now no laughing at me, my hero, little Zacchaeus. I love him because, well, we're both vertically challenged. And he heard Jesus was coming into town. He couldn't see above the crowd. He climbed a sycamore tree. He got up there, and Jesus looked at him and smiled and said, Today, Zacchaeus, I must come to your house. In an instant, this lying, cheating tax collector was transformed. Listen to what he said. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus' response, again with a smile on his face, was that today salvation has come to this house. You see, little Zach got it. Saul of Tarsus got it. I'm 
persecuting Christians. Now I'm sharing Christ even in the very place where I found myself. We must go beyond lip service. Our Christianity can't be just what we say or, or who we claim to be. But our Christianity has to be evident to other people. This is not work salvation. This is the change that happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So we must be able to demonstrate by the example of our lives. Remember Paul could write, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Every single man and woman who names the name of Christ ought to be able to declare that to the people in their lives. Is there evidence in your life that you've changed? Would the people closest to you acknowledge that you're different? You used to be one way and you're no longer that way. I told you uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ray Ray, who I love with all of my heart this church, he heard a message where I, I said I was Ron the Jerk. Well, that's all he can hear now. Last week, we had some brand new people in church. They come up to talk to me, and we're in one of those term, uh, tender moments. And Ray Ray comes up. This is between first and second service. Ray Ray comes up and says, do you know who this is? It's Ron the Jerk. <laughs> and the people didn't know what was going on. I said, look, if the shoe fits. <laughs> but can people in your life declare that you're not that person anymore? If the answer to those questions is no, well then examine your heart today to see whether or not you're in the faith. Verse 21, he explains, that is why, because I'm declaring repentance. We must change who we are. Well, that is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. You know, no preacher ever got persecuted for preaching a message about your best life now or the winner within. Or God wants you to be rich, he wants you to be healthy, and all you have to do is believe it. Nobody ever gets persecuted for a message like that. But it's a message that says you've got to turn from sin and turn to God. And then what we need to do is be grown enough, mature enough in our faith to understand that we're going to be persecuted for a message like that. The same reason people get angry at us today when we tell them that they need to stop doing what they're doing. It's why they say, don't judge me, bro. They say it because they hate it, and that's really true. There is a sign over the entrance to heaven, and I'm speaking figuratively, of course, that says repentance is required. We come to him on his terms. He is almighty, holy God, and we can't come to him and hold on to the filth in our world. Hold on to Christ, let go of all of the junk, and people will see that there's something different about you. You know, nobody was thrilled with Noah as he proclaimed the gospel of righteousness. That's all he had. Judgment is coming unless we repent. For 120 years, he's called in the New Testament a preacher of righteousness. He was also alone outside of his family for those 120 years. If you're more worried about people liking you or people wanting to talk to you, then you are pleasing the Lord. Well, then let's get to the nut of this Bible study. Repent and start walking the other direction after Jesus. Paul knew he wasn't alone, verse 22. He said, but I've had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. Now, Paul isn't acknowledging that Festus or Agrippa or Bernice are somebody great. What he's referring to, and he's doing this very respectfully, is their positions. So my message is the same. When I'm out with the normal people of the world, well, well my message is the same. You must repent and turn to God. Now when I'm standing before those of you who think you're something, well, my message remains the same. Now, I love the simplicity of this statement. What Paul is saying is, look, they tried to kill me, but here I am. It's Paul saying, look, I know I'm going to Rome because God told me that I was going to go to Rome. And I know I'm going to get there because Jesus said so. 
Then he says this, I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. His message is authenticated or validated by the word of God. And that's all we have to do when people look at you like you're crazy. Say, look, my message agrees with what the Bible says. Well, I don't believe in the Bible. It doesn't matter. The fact that you don't believe it doesn't make it true. Or not true, rather. It's true. And we need to validate what we say in the word of God. That the Christ would suffer. And as the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. This is a brilliantly simple summary of our gospel message. 1 Corinthians 15, the first three verses, is another simple uh, demonstration of what the gospel is. This is as simple as it gets. Christ would suffer. That's the suffering servant passages, Isaiah 50 and 53, most notably. Those are the passages that indicate that all the suffering, you know, one of the stumbling blocks to the early church was, well, well, how could God suffer? Why would God cause his own son? We're still asking questions about why do we have to suffer? Well, he did. Jesus said he suffered. They hated him. They persecuted him. They're going to hate us and persecute us. Suffering is part and parcel, Paul will say to the church at Philippi, sharing in the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings. Jesus suffered. He died. Those are historical facts beyond any doubt whatsoever. He rose from the dead, and because he's alive, he would show the way to salvation. He would be that light to all people, regardless of their nationality or religious background. Now, when you look at verse 23, the last word is Gentiles. You might write in your Bible their textings. Because that's the basis that we proclaim the truth of the gospel. He, he was dead, and then he wasn't. And that validated everything that he said about himself to be true And because of that, Texans are going to be in heaven. At this point, Festus, he's been sitting there quietly. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Now, this gives us an indication of Paul's intellect. Paul was one of those smartest guy in the room types. Wherever he was, whoever he was speaking to, Paul intellectually was smarter than they were. And Festus is probably listening to Paul talk and he's thinking, wait a minute, this this guy, he's so smart. Maybe he's even struggling a little bit with conviction of the Holy Spirit. But all of a sudden he hears about a man who was dead who's now alive. And said, this is too much. Now, certainly in a Roman culture, people had no concept of life after death. And so this was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. You're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you insane. You know, when we tell people about what we believe, the world around us looks at us like we've lost our mind. They think, well, you, you, you checked your brains in at the door. How could you believe such things? Well, we can proudly declare, I believe them because they're true, and there's evidence, not just evidence, but overwhelming evidence that would suggest even to you that it's true, if only you'd be honest enough to examine the evidence for yourself. The world that we live in thinks that we're just a bunch of narrow-minded, bigoted, homophobic Christians, and the world would be better off without us. Why the disconnect between what we know is true And what the world at least hopes, sincerely hopes, is not true? Well, Paul explains that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, we neglect or reject the gospel to our own parable. Now, let me take just a minute. I don't have time to elaborate on this much, but (coughs) let me take just a moment to challenge all of you 
to find out for yourselves if the Bible that we bring to church, the Bible that is the foundation for everything that we believe, you need to find out for yourself if it's true. 100% of it, not 90% of it, not it's a book with great principles to live by, but is it true, every single word? If it is, then it has to change your life. If it's not, well, then you can do whatever you want to do. What did Paul say? Eat, drink, and be merry. That's the basis of the choices that we make in life. Is it true? And you've got to be intellectually honest enough to find out. Don't just parrot what other people say. Well, you know it's full of contradictions or you know it's been translated so many times. How do we know we even have a Bible that we can depend on? Find out for yourself. As it did in my life, it will change yours. And since the moment I made that decision, since that very moment, I haven't had one moment's doubt about what we believe, about my eternal security, my salvation, nor have had a moment's doubt about being able to say that the Bible is everything that we need. Because the Bible reveals the person of Jesus and he is the one who we need. But you've got to find out for yourself. Paul not yelling like Festus yelled. I am not insane, most excellent Festus. He's still being respectful. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. Highlight that, please, especially the word reasonable. This Greek word for reasonable is an old word, and it's only used twice in the entire New Testament. It is the exact opposite of the word translated insane. No, what I'm saying to you is reasonable. And really what he's saying is, no, you think I'm crazy, but I've never been of sounder mind. That's what Paul is saying here. Now, God may act above reason. And certainly talking about a resurrection of a dead person is above reason. I mean, he's God, he can do what he wants. But God never acts contrary to reason. And we need to understand that our faith is reasonable. Isaiah, the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah, come and let us reason together. Let's just sort of examine the facts together. And by the way, husbands, wives, with your families, reasonable is a very productive, fruitful way to live. You can reason through your disagreements. You can reason through your arguments. If you've got a Bible open, then you can find the answers. Our faith, what we believe, is reasonable. Why would it cause any of us any concern that God can do these miracles? Our faith is reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, speaking to Agrippa, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, and I think the voice was very bold here. King Agrippa, I've been watching you while I'm talking. I can see the work of the Holy Spirit working on your heart right now. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Now remember, he was pleased that King Agrippa was there because King Agrippa, a Jew, at least by birth, was familiar with all the Jewish customs he understood about Christianity. He dealt with it many, many times. And now Paul says, look, I know you do. I know you do. You know, one of the things that I get to do, and remember, I'm blind, so please don't attach anything personal to this. But I can see people squirming in their seats. During the invitations, I can see people almost like battening down the hatches because the Spirit of God is working on it. I can see the struggle. Well, well, I don't need to deal with this now. I have time to deal with this. Remember, that's where Felix was. I'll find a more convenient time. Festus is just there for the ride. But Agrippa has been struggling with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
Now in sales, I was in the automobile business for 21 years. In sales, we would call this a closing question. Paul is asking Agrippa to make a choice. In the automobile business, when somebody was looking at a car and they would say, well, you know, I, I like the blue one, but, but I might like the white one too. And, you know, you hadn't negotiated any dollar amounts or anything yet. You'd get in the booth with them and you'd say, oh, I see you like the blue one. Do you like the blue one better than the white one? That's a closing question. The minute he says, oh, I like the blue one. Okay, well, let's get that one ready and we can proceed. Well, Paul is simply saying, you know these things are true, don't you? You know these things are true. I know it. I know it. I know it. Every single person is accountable to respond to God's invitation of eternal life or face the consequences. Agrippa didn't want to face the consequences. Verse 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Now, the King James translation is really, really bad because it's a little bit misleading. The King James says, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And it gives the impression that he was right on the edge. That's not at all what was going on here. Paul could see the struggle. He could see that the Holy Spirit was working on him. But he could also see Agrippa resisting what the Spirit was doing. And this question from Paul demonstrates the hardness of Agrippa's heart and his unwillingness to respond, his commitment to sin. Now, one of the things that we deal with all the time in the world that we live in is people's commitment to sin. Sadly, even Christians, we're, we're committed to sin. God is trying to, to, to rip us. He's trying to get us to take that turnaround. And we don't do it because we're more committed to sin than we are committed to him. Now, for Agrippa, this is going to be eternally tragic. He's hearing what he must do to go to heaven, and he's unwilling to do it. And in this particular case, it is likely because beautiful Bernice is sitting right next to him. And he realizes, if I do this, I'm going to have to change, and I don't want to get rid of her. She's the love of my life. Now, remember, this is creepy Bernice and Agrippa. Because they're brother and sister, but they didn't care. And she's probably sitting there filing her nails. She's so frustrated with the whole thing. But Agrippa doesn't want to shake things up. He doesn't want to risk losing you. You know why that's tragic for so many of us? As your pastor, I have seen people over our years here reject Jesus Christ and choose a human relationship in place of their relationship with Jesus Christ over and over and over again. But I love her. But, but I love him. Yeah, but, but he's married. Well, 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 I know, but he's going to leave her. And I know God brought us together because, well, I love him so much. And we looked at people and said, look, he, he's not available to you or she's not available to you. They belong to somebody else. This is sin. And way, way, way too often, they simply make a choice. I choose this human instead of Jesus. What did the human ever do for you? Did the human die for your sins? Did the human promise his love for you eternally? And the answer, of course, we understand is no. But we let our emotions get the best of us. Never, ever reject Jesus Christ, in favor of a human being, your life will be so much richer and fuller if you'll just be obedient. Whatever the reason for Agrippa, it separated him from God forever. Now, we can look back in history. We know that nearly now for 2,000 years, Agrippa has been in eternal torment. And it didn't have to be. In the same way, it doesn't have to be for you either. <clears throat> Verse 29 says, Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today, remember there's a big crowd, may become what I am, except 
for these chains. And we know Paul was very expressive. He would have lifted up his hands chained together. His feet would have been chained together while he was on trial. And Paul says, look, I want all of you to be just like me, except for these chains. And the appearance of the proceedings makes it appear like Paul is the one in chains, but he's not in chains at all. It is Festus and Agrippa and Bernice that are in chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with one another, I think that's another one of those nuggets. You know, they were talking with one another. They were all alone, and they're trying to make sense of what they just heard. And I think in Agrippa's case in particular, because he's the one that Paul singles out, I think in his case in particular, he, he would say something to, to Festus or to Bernice, like, well, well, what do you make of what he said? And maybe if just one of them would have said, well, you know, he made sense. What he said was reasonable. We know the history around here. We know everybody knows about Jesus and what happened. The resurrection is on everybody's lips. But instead, they just met together and talked each other out of it. I'm sure many of you have shared Jesus with somebody, a friend, a family member. And as soon as you're gone, they're on the phone to somebody else, a family member or another friend. And they're trying to talk each other out of the message that you delivered. Wow, have you talked to, and this is, I'll just use me as an example. People say, well, have you seen Ron? What's happened to him? He's completely different. And he told me about Jesus. And believe me, I was telling everybody about Jesus from the beginning. I couldn't look at somebody without expecting that they wanted what I had. They wanted to feel freedom like I felt for the very first time. And yet they'd talk to other people. No, he's just one of those nuts now. I think I've shared with you the story. I was up here praying. I used to come up here before, long before we were in this building. We'd come up here and pray every single day. I'd walk up here and pray and then walk around this place. I wanted the other side of this, this shopping center. And one day it was really, really cold. I had gloves and like layers on and a stocking cap pulled way over my head and sunglasses because it was bright. And, and all of a sudden these two police officers from Universal City pulled up. I said, hi, because they all knew me because I was the nut walking up and down Papago Road. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, you, you okay? And I said, well, well, yeah. How you guys doing? Been praying for you. And then they recognized me. And one guy turned to the other cop and said, it's okay. It's one of those religious nuts. <laughs> and the reason they called me is because some of the people in this shopping center thought I was just some crazy guy talking to myself out in the parking lot. Well, they said you were talking to yourself. I said, no, I wasn't. I never talked to myself. <laughs> Who were you talking to? I said, Jesus. And I got one of those looks. But you see, that's our job. Start where you are. Be obedient to what the Lord has told all of us. And God will use you to change other people. They talked among themselves. He said, this man's not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he'd not appealed to Caesar. Now, we might look at that and say, oh, Paul, you did the wrong thing. You could have been free. I'm telling you, in this chapter, Paul is the most free man out of all of the characters, out of anybody and everybody who heard his message. He was the one who is really and truly free. Not Agrippa, not Bernice. They're bound by sin. Not Festus. He's just trying to curry the favor of the Jews. Not anybody in the audience who rejected his message, Jew or Gentile. There was only one man who was free, 
and that was the Apostle Paul. Now, we'll close with this. Paul is finally going to Rome. God has helped me. God has protected me. We read that earlier. And now he's finally going to Rome. We find nothing against you, but you appeal to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. And his journey begins. Paul, at this point, has about two years, maybe just slightly under two years left in his life. And he's going to make the most out of every single day, every single moment, because he can continue to write letters. We know them as the prison epistles in our New Testament. He's going to continue to preach Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. He's going to continue to minister one-on-one with the people that he's been given the freedom to see even when he's in chains. At some point in Rome, he's going to be transferred to the infamous Mamertine prison and thrown in a literal dungeon. And then Caesar will have his head cut off. But at this point in our story, Paul says, I'm finally going to Rome. In the book of Romans, in chapter 15, as he's signing off, Paul says this in verse 29, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Now, before reading the rest of that passage in Romans, to many of us, this doesn't look like God's full blessing, does it? But Pastor Ron, you just said he's going to die. He's going to be in a dungeon and things are going to get really, really hard for him. His head is going to be cut off. That is the full measure of God's blessing. And he understood it. In his most personal of all of his epistles, Paul will write, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness and not only for me but for all of those who long for the Lord's appearing. This is the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I think sometimes we try so hard to avoid any trials or any difficulties that we can't see the full measure of God's blessing in our lives. After almost 29 years as the pastor of this great church, I can look back and see even the most painful things that we've had to deal with. Every one of those things made me more like Jesus. Every one of those things helped me to understand what Paul wrote. I've had God's protection and his blessing. Every one of those things has equipped me to be your pastor. Are you in the full measure of God's blessing in your life? If not, why not? Because today you can be. The rest of the passage in Romans 15 says this, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. And then he said this, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul was concerned about finishing well. In these last days, the last hours of the last days, we all of us need to be focused on one thing, Lord. What about me and what about today? And then we can take a step back and say, Jesus, empower me. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I'm full of your power, then nothing is impossible. We need to be about the Lord's business. We need to get started where we are and our obedience needs to be instant. And we can look at people and say, well, you know who I am now. You know because I'm not who I used to be. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to say.
to the people in your lives. And when you can say that, they'll be watching you, and it won't be long before they start asking about your Jesus. And isn't that the goal? Isn't that the reason that we were all left here until Jesus returns? He's coming soon. We need to be ready. Father, as we close this service this morning, I ask you to pour out your spirit. Your spirit has been at work throughout all of this.